Mill Serp Garage, Smith & Wesson, model 28, built on the Smith & Wesson N frame, it's a big boy, six shot, 357 revolver, it's called the uh, Highway Patrolman. So let's go back in time to the 27th, the Model 27. This is where it all starts. It all starts in 1934. Smith and Wesson uh, with uh, Elmer Keith, Philip Sharp, and uh, Douglas Wesson. Smith and Wesson Camp is pushing the 38 Special Round uh, to its limits in the 38 Special revolvers that they're dealing with. Um, they're coming up with, uh, this was their thing, these guys, they loved experimenting and pushing this cartridge to its um, max. And they pushed it to a point where they got like 160 grain bullets and 1,500 uh, feet per second and more out of these. And the, the, the guns that they're messing with just uh, can't handle it anymore. They see uh, a room for a newer, more powerful version of the 38 so they could load these cartridges um they have winchester um make this uh this ammo for them and uh the difference i'll show you these are our realistic snap caps here check these things out i i extol on the virtues of these things so much this is uh some information here um if you guys are interested the website my coupon code for 10 percent off these are excellent to mess around with and play with because they're completely inert. There's no primer. There's no powder. There's no nothing. So uh, it's the only real, true, safe way to uh, practice and um, check out these uh, different rounds and how they load into the gun. So 38 and 357. Let's pull out a couple here. And... Uh, wasn't for this horrible glare you'd actually be able to read that so here's the difference between 357 and 38 just the length i think it's an eighth of an inch or a tenth of an inch longer and the reason why they did that they did not need extra room in the case for more powder a lot of people think that like oh, it had to be built made bigger you know they only did that to make it so it's not backwards compatible so in other words Here's the gun they designed. The 357 round is designed for. And of course, 357 fits right in it. Now, the 38 is obviously lower powered. It could work as well. So it's shorter, so that'll fit too. You'd be able to fire both of them. Um, but now, the reason why they made it longer is because, let's say you take a 38, this is our Model 10. Let's say the 38s, you know, of course, 38 specials uh, go right in there. Not a problem. But if you try to load 357 in here, no good. You won't even be able to close the cylinder. So that's the reason why they made it longer, is just to make sure that the higher powered cartridges don't end up in the guns that can't handle it. And that was it. The, the The bullet is even the same. Here's an interesting thing. I had to look this up. I knew there was a reason. I had read it long ago, but I needed the information for this video and uh, delved into it a little bit more. It's uh, If you're interested, it pays to just do a little Google searching, poke around and check this out. So you might think, like, why is the 38 Special 38.38? And why is 357.357 if they're the same bullet, right? Well, the reason is because years ago when there was a 38 uh, long Colt and a 38 short Colt, they had what's called healed bullets, which means the bullet, the case was basically um, the same size as the bore. And it was uh, the, the, the round itself was larger it kind of like came up over the edge of the case. Here's like a graphic I could show you. I saw something online. I'll pull this up. This is 
This is kind of like what it looked like, what healed bullets were. The healed bullet was 0.379. So that's why they came up with 30, 38 caliber. So they just round it off to like 0.38. Now, in the more modern 38s, they didn't have that healed bullet anymore. When they didn't use a healed bullet, it was 0.357. So all modern 38 is really, they just called it 38 because when they changed from the healed bullets to, you know, the bullets that weren't healed, they couldn't change it from 38 to 357 because people would think it's something different, that they're, it's a totally different kind of ammo. They'd be like, you know, I'm here to buy 38 ammo. Where is it? I only see this 357 stuff. They didn't change what it was called or what the size of it was listed as. But um, that's the reason why. I guess when they were figuring out, are we going to call it 38 Magnum? I guess they figured, no, let's just go with what it's really, the size of what it really is now. And uh, that's why they went with the 357. But if you look in reloading data, you'll see 38 bullets and 357 Magnum bullets are the same, uh, you know, with three, they're, they're all 357 now. You know? Of course, unless you have healed bullets, 38 long Colt or short Colt. So, um, so that's an answer to that. Now let's, uh, geez, I don't even, I don't even know where to go with this thing. What are we going to talk about? The history, got some pretty cool history with this. The reason why there's a, tw a 28 and a 27 is kind of interesting. And even how I picked this thing up, I had been looking for one of these for a while, but this thing just came to me in a really weird way. Let's just get into some history first. So. 1934 is where they put together this round and it's kind of interesting that they came up with a gun to fit the round and not a round to fit the gun which is kind of interesting and there's a lot of like backward stuff like that with this so the 27 was actually invented when they already had the round ready for it you know what i mean so um they decided to go with smith and wesson's end frame and here the uh if you want to check out any kind of end frame history, the Roy Jinks book, History of Smith & Wesson, you can still find this book around um, for a decent price, and it's an excellent Smith, Smith & Wesson book. And here, you show all the end frames. We had the 44 hand ejector, first, second, third models. We had the, um, the uh, 455 hand ejector, 455 Mark II. Then we had, you know, that 45 caliber with the moon clips or whatever. You know, that was an end frame. And, uh, of course, the Model uh, model 29, which uh, which we love so much. But uh, here's the uh, here's our Highway Patrolman right here. And uh, here's the 27. And, the uh, of course, the 29. There we go. So, basically, oh, here's another. This book I got, too, at a gun show just recently. I think I might have showed it to you guys. Collector's Guide to American Cartridge Handguns. And boom, right there. They have them both right next to each other. That's pretty cool. And here, as you can see, they list a bunch of stuff here for the 27. And then over here under the 28, it just says 357 Magnum, same as for Model 27. So everything's basically the same. It does have a slightly different overall length. It's a, it's a little curious to me. I'm not 100% sure why. It might just have to do it. There's more of a deluxe crown or something on there. Maybe that's just like makes it an eighth of an inch longer or something. But uh, yeah, these Magna Grips were uh, popular on these then. Uh, instead of the Target Grips. They did have an option for the Target Grips, but... Uh, these Magda grips seem to be very popular back then for these. Um, where are we? So the Model 27 released in 1935. It was called the Registered Magnum. And each one was actually registered to an individual. Each one was like registered to a person. And they became so popular after a while... They couldn't just keep that up. They couldn't, they were, the demand was so high, they just were like, well, they were just releasing it normally as just a normal gun. And uh, then even the interest from law enforcement uh, came in, and law enforcement agencies wanted it. 
But they were like, listen, the thing, it's like a premier handgun. I mean, it was like, you know, one of their top quality ones, the bluing, the the sights, just the, the way they were put together. They were like very, very high quality, high polish. And these police agencies, they just want a utilitarian knock around. You know, they just want a workhorse. So uh, it was they were kind of like priced out of the game by being such a premier revolver. So Smith and Wesson saw the ability to make some money there um, to with selling them to police forces. So in 1954, they came out with the Highway Patrolman. It came out in uh, four inch, six inch um, sizes. There were some very rare ones, like an eight, uh, eight and three eighths inch. I mean, there literally were just a few of those, and then, and then uh, so the high, Florida Highway Patrol ordered like thirty of them and nickel plated or something like that. So there's there's a couple of you know, you could have a couple of trivia questions where like you know what size did they make it in? And it's, it's, you, you technically would be wrong if you just said four inch and six inch because there were a few others, very rare, but for the most part, that's what you're going to see them in when you check them out in the gun stores. And uh, in 57, they was when, you know, if you check out back in my videos, you're going to see a video on the Model 19. So my, my Model 19, this is the K-frame. Uh, this one is a 1963. So the Model 19, if you remember what we talked about, we talked about the forcing cone here being slightly weak spot because of this uh, flat area you could see here on the bottom see that flat area on the bottom and that's that's there because in a smaller frame so when it closes you can see that right here there's interference from the cylinder right there in order for it to fit it has to have a slight relief cut into here and that's why they say there's some failures with these model 19s if they they're on a steady diet of, of uh, 357. Um, you remember we went into that. Check out the video, and you'll see uh, me talking about that. Uh, the Combat Magnum in 357 from Smith & Wesson supposedly had a weak point there. So a lot of people I think it's nonsense, but um, I have seen pictures of uh, broken forcing cones, you know, so there might be some truth to it. But um, as you can see, the larger end frame, look at how much beefier, look how much beefier the barrel is here, number one. I mean, I just look at, just look at, looking at that, you see that it's larger and no relief needs to be cut down in the bottom here because it's so much larger that there was room for this to just close. You can see there's an air gap there. And, uh, this is what supposedly made these things solid as all you'd expect, you know, a 357 to be. And that you could just, they're like, you know, a lifetime of eating 357s with no problem. So if, if a 38 Special just isn't your thing and you really just want to like go to the range all the time and like go through boxes of 100, 357, you know, and high powered stuff you're interested in bumping up the loads trying to get the most powerful 357 loads to you know the model 19 probably isn't for you they're probably a lot of uh 38 38 plus p even um out of there and some occasional 357 they say is for that person but but a uh dedicated 357 lover is going to uh, need to upgrade here and uh yeah, that's uh, that's the story with uh, like some history. Let's get into like some some numbers here. Let's check this out. So I I am um, oh and uh, what else do I have over here? And I'll get into that later. So the paperwork that I have here, I downloaded this from GunWiki. What did this have that I wanted to uh, talk about? Uh, probably everything that I just talked about. There's uh, Wikipedia's got a cool page here. Production was 54 to 86. They called it a budget version of the Smith & Wesson Model 27. 
Here's some uh, agencies that used it. Florida Highway Patrol. Look, even New York State Police. San Francisco Police. Uh, U.S. Border Patrol. Interesting. Uh, fewer than 100 reported as being manufactured with 8 and 3 eighths inch barrel. 25 guns with 5 inch barrels and nickel finish marked FHP Florida Highway Patrol. 20 vets. They actually, actually like made 25 of them for them. How many guys were in Florida Highway Patrol? 25 officers? Um, and it's about it. There isn't, you know, it's, uh, there isn't a lot of crazy information here. Here's the numbers. This is what's kind of cool. So numbering them, this is where uh, things get crazy. This is just the end frame in general. So the end frame been around since 1908. I mean, the end frame has been around a long time. Um, Pre-war, we had some uh, some serial numbers here. It's post-war where they start these S series. This is probably what you're going to see. If you find one in a gun store, you're either going to see an S or an N. So if it's an S, here's the numbers. And they pretty much go year by year, which is kind of cool. But it's like late one year, early another year. So you could never really tell. You could. There's no exact cutoff. You know what I'm saying? So you're even estimating a little bit here without the exact letter. But here, I'm in the N frame, Bill. Uh, and uh, N prefix, the serial number, N series. And the N series started here in 70. And they break it down. See, they only have from here to here. I'm in that bracket. And it's 75 to 77. So you're not really 100% sure, like I said, unless you send away for the letter. I don't even think then you're guaranteed. They might say we don't have any information on it. But um, I'm kind of like towards the early side of this number gap. So I just went with 75, even though that might not necessarily be true because there's allotments of the serial numbers that were spread across the board to different guns. So you never really know. Like even Model 29s have this same series. So if you be looking up a Model 29, a 44, uh, 44 Magnum gun with the same serial numbers. But that's where I'm estimating. I'm saying it's 75. Maybe one of these days, you know, I'll just... Uh, get the letter or I think you could sign up to just get as many letters as you want over a period of time I'll just do all my guns who knows who knows so yeah huge difference with the uh the uh, the k-frame huh big difference in size here stepping up I was I really was looking for one of these for a long time because as you guys know I love my model 29 my model 29 and 44 Magnum 1973. I love this thing. So um, I always did want another end frame in 357, but uh, just never really seemed to find the right one. Now I'm going to tell you the story with this guy. Here's how this happened. I was in a gun store uh, picking up a completely different, a completely different uh, gun. I was picking up. A, uh, a transfer. Uh, I use this gun store as my as my FFL, right? So I'm waiting for the background check, the paperwork to get done, and I wander over to the holster bin, the five dollar holster bin, where it's like just a bunch of like nylon holsters, crappy holsters, sweaty soaked uh, ankle holsters, all used stuff. And I see this sitting there. And I'm like, man, that has to be Smith and Wesson. I'm thinking, I'm gonna put my uh my 44 in here. I'm gonna put my my model 29 in this thing. Again, this thing, this isn't even in the picture. I'm picking up something totally different, which I am gonna be doing a video on soon, so don't worry about that. But um in my brain, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, model 29. Boom. You know, that's what I'm like. It's going to go right in there. And sure enough. So I take I take these numbers right here, right? Sorry. I take these numbers right here and I run them. 
and I come up with this information right here. I come up with, I'm looking at web pages where it's showing, uh, it's showing Anaconda and, uh, you know, a couple other guns, but it's showing six inch end frame Smith and Wesson. I was right. And, um, I put it down on the counter and I'm getting this. And as I'm looking around, I'm kind of like poking around at a couple of other holsters. Some dude in there goes, uh, oh, that's, uh, no, that's not Smith & Wesson. I, I might have mentioned I put it down. I said to the guy, hey, I'm gonna, this is good for my uh, my Model 29. And he said, no, no, no. That's uh, that's for the uh, Colt Python. And I was like, no, yeah, it does look like it's the same size. It is for a large frame revolver like that. But I, I just ran the numbers. It's a DeSantis holster. I just ran the numbers off of it. This one is for, uh, this particular one is for uh, end frame Smith & Wesson. The Anaconda is listed at, that it fits here, but not the uh, not the um, Python. But uh, they do sell a Python one, you know. Make a conversation with the guy. He goes, no, I'm telling you, is what he says. I could tell just by looking at it that that's, uh, that's Python. I could tell by looking at it. Now, I'm standing at the counter just like I'm standing right here. It's a glass counter, and I see down on the bottom, this is like a, it's like the Smith & Wesson um area i happen to be standing in there's all snub noses on the top mid frame like you know k frames in the middle a few end frames on the bottom and i go uh i know the kid behind the counter well and i go i go well yeah maybe uh i know i'm right i just looked it up but i go yeah maybe you're right let me you know i only i only want it if it fits the the you know the smith and wesson and he goes well it doesn't so i'll i'll take it from you now i'm realizing i'm like oh this guy's trying to get this holster from me he wants it that's why he's telling me no 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 it's not doesn't fit what you want it for you know i didn't really he goes that holster is five dollars he only noticed it after i mentioned it and put it on the counter and asked if it was five bucks so i i'm thinking his motive now is to tell me no 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 that's for a python that's uh so it's not going to work for you but i'll take it and I pointed to the bottom and I said, here, give me that. What is that? You got down there a, uh, a K frame revolver, uh, an end frame revolver down there. What's that one right there? Give it to me. Yeah, he hands it to me. And I go, I just, I need to check just to make sure maybe he's right now. He, he could have it. And right in there it goes. It's absolutely perfect. Fits like a glove. And uh, there it is. And I'm like, see, goes right in there. He slinks away plan didn't work and i go yeah thanks a lot here's the uh kit wait a minute hold on a minute not so fast i mean granted it was dirty it was caked up but i'm looking at this thing it's got a tag on it it's on consignment now i don't know what to do i'm i'm falling in love i'm realizing i could clean it up i'm realizing it's exactly what i'm looking for so they call the guy up. He knocks 50 bucks off of me. He says he's got some accessories for it that'll give me. And uh, the FFL is nice enough. He goes, hey, if you buy it, I'll knock off the transfer fee for the other gun. You know what I mean? So then there you go. I'm like, that's uh, sounding, sounding like a sweet deal to me. So boom, I'm going, putting both, uh, putting both to my name right now. So I bought it. Now... The accessories, I forget all about these accessories. You know, it's like a couple of days go by. I pull out the uh, the tag, the hang tag that I had that was on here. And I realize on the hang tag, it says with box and paperwork. And I didn't even realize, I didn't even ask about this box and paperwork. So uh, I call him up and I ask and he goes, yeah, you know what? There was There was a box. I forgot to even look. And the guy came in and he brought your stuff, so uh, come down and check it out. So I come down, I check it out. Here's what I get. I got the box with, like, you know, the original uh, gun matching information on it, so I know it is the box. We have the original paperwork, the original booklet that came with it. And here's all this stuff that he had for me. Check this out. We have a millet Smith & Wesson uh, sight, sight system. 
this was actually on the gun and I took it off and went back to stock. So what he had in here was the original sight. But uh, this is a cool sight. Let's get maybe some more light. This is a, no, that didn't do anything. That made it worse. Why did more light make it worse in here? I don't know. But uh, this is pretty cool. Um, but I took it off. I put the, I wanted the original one back on there for now. But that's a nice option. And this is vintage, you know what I mean? This is old school. We got some grips. So we got like a set of target grips. This one, chip right there though. Piece missing right out of it right there. But uh, nice nonetheless. Listen. Here's another set of... Um, another set of Magna grips. This nice Packmire. This is nice. I put it on. It looks like it needs to be cleaned up a little bit. But it went on there nice. It really is a nice one. Yep. And... What brand was this again? I think when I took it apart inside, it said what it was, but I forgot. But this is nice, kind of nice, too. And remember, these all fit on the Model 29 as well, if, uh, you know, you want to mess around. Uh, it also came with, where are they? came with these two speed loaders and this one. So these two plus one totally in the package not even opened and this is like way old school hks speed loader so here's the hang tag and check this out this was really cool this was a cool score this you're gonna like what could this possibly be an original four inch barrel and it even has you know it's complete like it's not like it comes stripped where it doesn't have the detent here even it's in there sight on it you know everything so here's where the pinned recess thing uh happens you could see that relief in the top there is um and it's threaded so it's threaded on and then that's where the pin comes in. The pin goes right through there. See, and that's where it actually pins the uh, pins the barrel on. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, it's nice. So um, evidently he wanted to go to the four inch. And uh, is there is there a slim chance that it it originally was a four inch and this was the barrel? And uh, he bought this to swap it out to. I mean, I, I guess. I guess that's possible. But this, and this is, this says Highway Patrolman. This isn't like a Model 27 barrel. This is the, this is what would have been on here. Maybe I should, maybe I will pay Smith & Wesson for the letter for this one just to find out what's going on. To see if he was the original owner. He's got all this stuff. See what they have on it. I think I'm going to do that. I'll let you guys know. I'm going to go in there. I'm going to go for it. I never did that before, the letter of authenticity thing, but <laughs> I'm going to give it a try. So that's the pinned part is that, that pin that holds the barrel on. And then the recessed part is that each cylinder is cut out over here like this for the rounds drop all the way down flat. Again, if you're just tuning in in the middle, these are not live rounds. These are snap caps. They're not even just like dummy rounds or whatever you'd call it. They're totally inert. There's, there's uh, nothing going on here. No primer. Primer is silicone to protect the firing pin. And uh, there's no powder inside of them. And uh, the projectiles, the quote-unquote projectiles, are glued solid in here, bonded so that they don't loosen up or come out from loading and reloading, especially with semi-autos, you know, they take a beating. I have beaten the crap out of these things. They are not falling apart. And what's nice with this is you can see how they, how they go in, how 
if it binds when the action works, you know, and you could uh, more safely dry fire it without worrying that the firing pin or it's taking a shock. I mean, dry firing is never, never good. There's not really much of a reason to do it except to just take a look and see that your firing pin is contacting the silicone there. And you could see that it definitely is nice and uh, nice solid contact being made. And uh, model 28, the difference uh, in the finish, you can see here that's along the top is not checkered. It's just a matte, matte finish here along the top. And along the bottom, you could see it's like they call it, they call it like bead blasted or there's a couple of different names that I hear it called, but it's basically this, this satin bead blasted looking finish here along the bottom edge. And just the bluing on the rest of it just isn't that bright, shiny bluing. It's just kind of like more of a matte look to it, more of a dulled look to the bluing. But you know what? After having, you know, from having so many of, uh, of of these guys, of ones that are just so blued that they're they're gleaming. I mean, you could like shave in some of these. Um, it's kind of nice to have one. You see how even along the bottom here it'll be shiny. It's kind of nice to have this one that's more like a workhorse like this. You know what I mean? You know, good shooter. You feel you feel cool about shooting it. That you know you're not. Uh, it's not like degrading as much, let's say, that it's, uh, you know, that you it's not so shiny from handling it or whatever. But um, even like looking at the Model 29, there's differences in the finish. It's tough to see here, but the cylinder and the barrel are shinier than the frame. You know, they have various levels of how they're polished or how they're blued. Um, it's interesting when you look at them. Here's the, uh, the Model 19 has like a much darker, much darker, shinier type of bluing. It's like a, like, looks like an even higher quality than the 29. And, uh, it's kind of nice to just have one that's, uh, you could handle without getting like a, every time you touch it, you don't have to wipe it down that you're getting fingerprints on it, you know? So that's the model 28. Yeah, my Model 28 goes right in the gun safe, right next to the 29. We got our holster, the $5 holster he gave to me also for free. So it was like a nice deal. It worked out where it was just like meant to be. And this is a cool, cool kind of holster. It's got like a dual, you know, if you see the belt, your belt could go straight through this way or through this way. So it's made for like, reverse carry so it's like if you're tightening up your belt say you're looking right at it like you're standing there putting it on on your waist your belt would come right through here so it basically sits like that right there on this side so you cross draw so your thumb hits the snap here and your cross draw out like that so it's pretty cool it's like a, a hunting hunter's holster i think they call it hunting type you know that's the style but um these big guns like this the cross draw works really well and uh yeah that's it we'll uh enjoy these accessories i am going to check into that i, I want to know what's going on i wonder if he bought this and never used it that's what i assumed but maybe he did maybe he bought this just like the site you know the original site was in the box in the in the paper just like this is, uh, you know, wrapped in the paper. So it's almost like as if maybe he, but this, it wouldn't fit in this bag. And this amount of paper doesn't look like it would cover the larger barrel. So well, it is interesting, but the, the original site was in the box. Maybe the original barrels also in the box. Maybe he made a couple of changes and just saved everything. Or it could be that he bought this and just never used it. We will never know. No, no. We might know. I'm going to look into it. I'm going to see. I'm going to see if I can get this letter. 
and uh, maybe Smith and Wesson can tell us how this came out of the factory and where it went. And until then, you all take care. I know it's been a while; things have been busy, but I got uh, I got enough content to keep you happy. We just got to uh, get in here and actually, you know, have some time to do it. And uh, that's how it works. We'll see you all soon. I'm gonna come back with, uh, let's see, should I give you a hint? Yeah, I'll give you a hint. Next video, you're gonna wanna watch it. How about that? See you all later.